Wonderful, it's like summer. We don't have to start suffering with the cold weather. Um, we welcome two distinguished scholars today, our total art and visiting professor, our third one, Michael Stebbins, and our guest lecturer today, Neil Ormeroy from Australia, whose accent you will hear shortly. And um, both of them are known to us and friends of ours for a very long time, so we welcome them to this opening guest lecture of the Center for Catholic Studies, the 22nd year of programs. So we're very, very pleased um, to be around for 22 years and to welcome you. We have a full program this year. Please check our website. Um, and thank you once again to our distinguished scholars today on the idea of a university, based, based on the idea of a university, John Henry Newman's seminal work, which haven't read, try reading it this year, the year of his canonization. We'll be having several programs over the course of the academic year um, commemorating uh, John Henry Newman and his important work, especially in relation to um, the university. So to introduce our speaker today and to tell you a little bit more about our topic, um, we welcome the University Professor of Catholic Thought and Culture still Monsignor Richard Liddy, our fearless leader, um, and please welcome our introduce our topic. Thank you. Thanks. I want to thank the new day for all she does for us, has done through the years, and uh, of course Ashley, uh, our GA too, is, is a tremendous help this year. So I'm happy to introduce um, a colloquium or a dialogue on the idea of a Catholic university today. And it is very appropriate that uh, we remember John Henry Newman, who will be canonized the saint of the Catholic Church on October 13th. And if you look in the crowd very closely, you'll see me uh, <laughs> waving to the cameras. But um, I was fortunate enough to be part of the process of Newman becoming a saint and sign my name to uh, people who read his books. And, and, uh, today we honor especially his book, the, the Idea of the University. And I thought I'd read a quote from a scholar at uh, Yale University, Frank Turner, one of the well-known for his works on Newman. He didn't always like Newman, I must say that. But he, uh, he really, Anyway, this quote about the idea of the university is quite something. He says, no work in the English language has had more influence on the public ideals of higher education. No other book on the character and purposes of universities has received so frequent citation and praise by other academic commentators. Like the negotiator who succeeds by being the first person get his material on the table, Newman against all odds and experience, experience established the framework within which later generations have considered university academic life. And uh, on the flyer for today is a quote from a teacher at the University of Toronto, George Paris. He speaks of the idea of the university as the most influential book ever written in the English language about universities. So it's um, quite something to have uh, two scholars here today to share with us. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to their sharing and their hearing each of them and, uh, and then hearing them uh, speak to each other and involve all of us today about the identity and mission of the Catholic University today. Um, I'll introduce Neil Omer first. I, when I think of Neil, who is from Australia, here with his lovely wife, Pia, um, it's wonderful to welcome him here to Seton Hall. He's been here before. Um, I remember uh, being in Mainz, Germany, and uh, having to leave a conference there early, and walking down dark streets in Mainz, Germany, and there on the other side of the street was another fellow. And who was it but uh, Neil? He said, I know that guy. And he was 
was on its way to Australia, and I was on my way back here to the state. So Neil has had a distinguished career. He's published a great many uh, articles and books throughout the year, throughout the years. Um, he is the executive officer in research analytics at the Sydney College of Divinity. Previously, he was a professor of theology in the School of Theology and member of the Institute for Religion and Critical Inquiry at the Australian Catholic University in Strathfield, Australia. He has worked professionally in theology for over 25 years and is widely published in Australia. And I'll also, uh, at this point, also introduce Mike Steadman. He will be speaking first. I'll introduce Mike who has come to Seton Hall a number of times through the years and uh, actually was instrumental in our core curriculum here at Seton Hall being established a number of years ago, uh, 2001, 2002. He ran a workshop and out of that came uh, the core that a number of us here have been involved in through the years. Um, he, um, his doctoral dissertation was on grace called The Divine Initiative, Grace, World Order, and Human Freedom in the Writings of Bernard Lonergan. He did his doctorate at Boston College. He was a member of the uh, Woodstock Theological Center in the mid-1990s, and that's when I got to know Mike. And um, during that time, he would come up to New Jersey and he did seminars in uh, Bergen County uh, with Bill Toth. So he's this year's Toth Lonergan Fellow in uh, Interdisciplinary Studies. So we're very happy that Mike's here. We got to know Bill and Kathy Toth is here. I'm delighted Kathy is here today. And they would work together on business ethics. Um, how, does, how does the Word of God have anything to do with what we do in our worlds of business? And last night Mike told me that he was he had a class with Father Lonergan at Boston College on Lonergan's economics, which is quite simple. Lonergan was convinced that if you really want to help the poor, you'll learn some economics. And Mike, last night, very briefly said, if you're learning the natural law of economic activity, of production and consumption, and how that works, and how to think about that, so that we can really have a human community that prospers and, and is a genuinely loving and helpful community to all, all of us. So anyway, uh, I'm delighted to have these two scholars here and to introduce them under the shadow of uh, Cardinal Newman, who will be uh, canonized the saint before too long. And now I'm happy to introduce uh, Neil today. So welcome. Over 
what has it made of a higher education institution to be a university? Uh, we have a, we, our higher education system is quite tightly regulated by the government. The name <coughs> university is a restricted name. It can only be used with government approval. And so uh, to call yourself a university, you have to meet certain standards. Um, now, <coughs> that is being uh, currently debated. And the big debate was whether it was possible for a university to be a teaching only institution. Yeah, and uh, uh, that debate seems to have uh, reached a stage now where they're saying no. Uh, <coughs> all Australian universities are expected to be involved in research at some level. Uh, that will have to be quantified to know exactly what they mean by that. Uh, but it's a, an affirmation of the strong link between a university and a culture of research. Now I mentioned this partly because this is not something Newman himself envisaged. He thought research was perhaps better done in research institutes. Uh, but this is perhaps more the German model, where uh, research is seen as intrinsic to the identity of the university. Now, in talking about what it means to be a university, there are probably two approaches we could take. One would be to conceive of some sort of platonic ideal, that this is what a university should be and we, we form some sort of ideal image of it. Or we could do a more Aristotelian approach which would say, let's look at what universities are, what they're doing, and try and find some intelligibility into, into, that, uh, what, into that data. Now here, if I may be a little bit critical of Newman, or at least the way in which Newman is read, um, I think a lot of people who read Newman read him as positing some sort of ideal form of what a university should be. Now, that may well have been functional in the 19th century when he was writing, but universities of today are simply not the same institutions that they were in the 19th century. They have significantly changed. Uh, and part of the process of asking what is a university is to ask, well, what is a university? What is it meant to do? Um, so I talk about universities firstly as an institutional form. An institutional form uh, is a product of practical intelligence which is designed to meet a recurrent need. That recurrent need is educational. Uh, so we want to be able to educate people not just today, not just tomorrow, but week in, week out, year in, year out. So that means an educational form which requires teachers, it requires libraries, it requires curricula, it requires administrative staff, uh, and there are funding issues for all this. So what we see uh, is that that type of institutional form, uh, every country has arrived at a different set of practical solutions to meet that need. And uh, the American system is one particular system. Uh, the Australian system is very different. The European systems are different again. I'm not sure about the Latin American systems, but they are different again, I would dare say. That there is um, a different set of uh, settings to all those sort of things that constitute a, uh, the meeting of the recurrent need for education. So there may be a mix of public and private institutions. Uh, America has a large number of, very, of private institutions and uh, state institutions as well. In Australia, we have, I think, 44 universities now. Three of them are private. The rest are all publicly funded, including Australian Catholic University. It is a publicly funded Catholic higher education institution. Uh, there's a mix of funding formulae 
that operate, a mix between student contributions uh, and uh, public government funding. In Australia, uh, that mix is probably about 50-50 on average. So the government provides 50% of the funding, more or less. The student provides 50% of the funding, which is then um, uh, <coughs> paid through a student loan system. America seems, at least in their private institutions, to be largely privately funded through the student contribution, which is paid back through loans. Um, there are different uh, accrediting and quality standards in different countries. So, say, Australian system is very tightly regulated. Uh, the American system, well, we all know Trump could start his own university. Uh, so it doesn't appear as if they are as strongly <laughs> regulated here as, uh, as they would be in Australia. Um, another thing is a mix of residential university systems versus non-residential university systems. Most Australian universities, the students are non-residential. Now, all these things create different concerns about money, about costs, and so on. One thing which is very, very different here is, uh, as I understand it, I'm willing to be corrected, but in the US, the first degree that a student does will be a sort of generalist degree with perhaps some preparation for a professional program as a graduate program. <laughs> In Australia, just about all those graduate programs are first degrees. Okay, so if you want to be a doctor, it's a first degree. If you want to be an engineer, it's a first degree. If you want to be a physicist or a social worker or a mathematician or whatever, they are first degree options. So a teacher and so on. This has large implications for the cost of higher education. So if you can get through a degree program in four years and into a profession, it's very different from five or six years of an undergraduate degree added on to uh, a master's professional qualification. Now, um, all this is to say, and we could do the same sort of thing in other nations, is that there are many different solutions to the problem of education. Um, none of the, the, one of the advantages, say, of the American system, of course, is uh, the use of a liberal arts <coughs> as a first qualification. So you have a number of institutions that specialise in liberal arts, and this is used, I think, in a lot of Catholic institutions to then have a core curriculum, a liberal arts stream, which focuses them in on the issues of Catholic identity and mission and so on. Uh, that's much harder to do if your university, the first degree is a professional degree. So if you're to be a Catholic university in the sort of situation I'm in, you have to find different ways of doing it than necessarily some sort of core curriculum program. Now the other thing of course is that we talk about the education, uh, that these are institutions designed for education. But education for what end? <coughs> that has changed over the last 200 years. Uh, let's face it, universities, when Newman was writing, were elite institutions. Very, very few people went to university. And the purpose of the university was largely about cultural reproduction. So people were educated in the high points and values of the culture in which they are in. Which is a good thing. I've got no problem with that. That's not the situation of universities now. We've increasingly moved towards the massification of higher education. Uh, university populations now are about 30%, 35% of uh, the the total population. So we expect about a 35% participation rate in higher education. That would have been unheard of in Newman's time. <coughs> Just unheard of. Um, so there's, there's been this shift from a relatively small elitist conception of university education and its purpose 
a, a shift from being a cultural institution to much more being one which is educating people for their careers, a job. Now, I'm not one to romanticise that shift. I think it's about these institutions, which we call universities, have grown to meet a different set of problems that had to be met. We require a better educated workforce. We require people to have a better understanding. We require more people to have that better understanding so that it's part of the complexity of the society that we live in that we require people to be educated for so much longer. The problem with educating people for longer and longer then becomes an economic problem. Uh, and from all that I hear in the situation in the US, <coughs> this economic problem is starting to cause massive strains in the system. That the burden of student loans is staggering, uh, that it affects people in all sorts of ways. And um, uh, some of my colleagues uh, tell me that uh, a lot of the smaller institutions, particularly those in rural settings, which used to be attractive to send people off, these are now being forced to close because they cannot uh, justify, uh, parents and the students cannot justify the cost of the higher education involved. <clears throat> so, as I say, institutional change uh, is a result of a redesign of our universities to meet a different set of practical questions. Uh, now, while we may uh, you know, feel the loss of that very particular cultural process, which was valuable, <coughs> It may be that we need a different type of institution now to do that. We need a different type of institution which provides that cultural education. I'll just put that out there. Now, <coughs> if that's, that's the situation of being a university in all its diversity, <coughs> just looking at the difference in Australia and the US then that could easily be multiplied by looking at other situations. What then makes a, a university Catholic? Uh, that becomes an issue. I've written various papers on what I've called identity and mission issues in Catholic education. Um, and <coughs> I introduced this language to our Vice-Chancellor, who is the sort of president of the institution, and he picked, uh, picked it up and ran with it. So we then had an, inst uh, an institute of mission and identity uh, in the university. Uh, and it provides a nice sort of dialectic tension between issues of one's Catholic identity and engagement in what is the mission of the church which is a larger question. And uh, I often think um, our university is owned by religious orders and by dios the diocese within which the university is based. So you've got a mix of bishops and archbishops and heads of religious orders. And when I first went to the university, the religious orders had a fair bit of control which meant, I think, we were much more mission-focused. When our new Vice-Chancellor came along, he thought, well, that's all well and good, but the religious orders don't have any money, whereas the diocese do have money. And, and he shifted the pendulum back to identity issues. Now, what makes us count? Now, I think both are important, but I saw that shift in our university to the point where uh, people would people who had been at the university for 10, 15 years would get up in academic board and say, I don't feel I belong here anymore because I'm not Catholic. And so that's the sort of pendulum swing that it can go through. 
Now this time I just want to finesse that sort of language a little bit and I want to use a notion that Bernard Lonergan introduces of functions of meaning. Because meaning functions in various ways. Um, one way in which meaning functions is about conveying truth. And that's obviously very, very important. So he calls that the cognitive function of meaning. But he says that's not the only way in which meaning operates. Meaning is also constitutive. That is, it's about the identity of a group. So there are shared meanings that we have which constitutes us as a community. He also talks about effective meaning that is meaning which creates or affects a new situation. Uh, and finally, he talks about the communicative function of meaning, which is like I'm trying to communicate to you. So there's something we're trying to dialogue or communicate with one another. So there's a communicative function. Now, as a community, the Catholic community uh, takes part in all those different types of functions of meaning. We are concerned with cognitive meaning, that is, issues of truth. So we're concerned with certain teachings which we hold to be true. Uh, and that means that focus on cognitive meanings means a focus on doctrines and dogmas, preserving and def uh, defending those, perhaps apologetics, uh, that's an important function of a function of meaning in the Catholic context. There's also a constitutive meaning because that identity is far more than the cognitive element. There are other elements too which are part of our identity but they're much more malleable and passing. So, because when I was a child, and I'm sure Dick will remember this, you know, how did you know a Catholic? They didn't eat meat on Friday. Now that's a constitutive meaning. It was part of the shared meanings and values of the community at that time. It's not now. But there are other aspects of Catholic piety, say the Rosary or Eucharistic Adoration and so on, types of art and the like, which are part of that constitutive meaning. They're not doctrines, they're not dogmas, but they identify a particular group as Catholic. Uh, there's always a danger of either uh, reducing constitutive meaning to doctrine and think that the only things that constitute us as a community are the doctrines. But there's also a, a difficulty of inflating the cognitive meanings to the constitutive meanings and thinking we must hold to all those constitutive meanings with all the energy that we hold our doctrines. Because when uh, Vatican II occurred, a lot of people said there were no new doctrines. You know, there were no new doctrines. As if that was the only important thing to say. In fact, there were massive changes in the constitutive meanings that were operating. That's what discombobulated a lot of people. A lot of people, that sense of shifting identity, not because we believe different things to be true, but there were other things which were part of our identity which started to move. That was uh, the constitutive meaning. Both those meanings, cognitive and constitutive, are part of that identity function. They're part of what we identify as this is what it means to be a Catholic. On the other hand, when we look at the effective meanings, these are about how we engage in the transformative mission of the church. These are the work we do to work for the kingdom of God, most obviously these are in el elements of mission and service. And uh, I know some of the Catholic universities that I've visited over the years, they often have very strong mission programs, mission outreach programs. 
uh, and that's very praiseworthy. But there's also a communicative function of painting. That is, the message is to be preached to others. That, you know, we do want to build workers for the building of the kingdom. We do need workers for the field. So that uh, generally would come under the banner of evangelization. Uh, so we have uh, doctrine and dogmas, we have constitutive meaning conceived more broadly, we have uh, effective meaning which is about the mission, engaging in the mission of the church, and we have uh, an evangelizing function, a preaching function. Now what I see uh, again in the American situation is that uh, what, we, what I see in those uh, colleges and universities is different ways in which um, Catholic institutions configure themselves around those functions. Some of them place much more emphasis on doctrine or on constitutive meaning more broadly or on evangelization or on mission. They are all operating often with a focus on one of those or certainly a mix of those different functions of meaning. Now, one might ask, is there a right mix? Is there a correct mix? Probably not. Probably there's a, again, because these institutions are practical, the, the results of practical insights into concrete situations. They are responding to their understanding of the concrete situation that they find themselves in, in different ways. When this, the way in which this then becomes problematic is when um, either any of these particular functions are not necessarily not engaged in, but are disparaged. <coughs> when, uh, you know, uh, one institution will say, oh, you're only interested in the mission. Okay? Or you're only interested in doctrines. Or you're only interested in evangelization. That's doctrine. Like, right? there has to be some way of acknowledging that all these contribute to what it means to, a cap to be a Catholic institution to find the mix which is right for the concrete situation in which the university is established and to move forward from there. <coughs> That's what I had to say. things that um, I bring with me here to this position, which I'm very honored to have, having known both Bill Toth and Father Lonergan, um, is some experience in Catholic health care. So for the nine years, roughly, that we were uh, in South Dakota, of all places, um, I had responsibility for the way the mission was talked about. Um, the way the mission was integrated into the operations of the Catholic health care system. Uh, it was called Avera Health. It operates in <coughs> South Dakota, uh, Minnesota, Iowa, and Nebraska. And um, uh, it's a different kind of institution from a university, but I want to draw a few points of comparison, also some points of difference. Um, I won't talk solely about that. Um, but after Neil's um, of laying out for us uh, these structural issues that Catholic universities face. I want to uh, take the conversation in my remarks a little more towards how do faculty and administrators communicate the mission to the audiences they work with? That's the problem I often faced 
a similar problem in Catholic healthcare. So I was responsible for putting together formation programs for leaders. Um, certainly everybody at the executive level and then also down to the director level and then as time went on and we were able to kind of spread this out more even down to uh, some frontline managers. And we talk about scripture, we talk about prayer. You can do that in the Midwest. Everybody goes to church, <laughs> more or less. Uh, the big, it's not a, it's, it's not a uh, majority Catholic population by any means, but um, a lot of Lutherans, a lot of Reformed uh, uh, churchgoers. Um, so we were able to talk about prayer, we were able to pray at work, and people kind of appreciated that. We talk about leadership, and we talk about the mission, the mission of the, of the Catholic healthcare system, which for us, as for Catholic healthcare generally, is conceived of as being continuing the healing ministry of Jesus. So it's, a, it's talked about in terms of discipleship, essentially. Now, of course, the fact that it's a Catholic system doesn't mean that everyone's Catholic. As I just said, we were living in an area where most people weren't. And the mix of uh, employees in the system pretty much mirrored what was in the general population. So people were always concerned, you know, not to be... They didn't want us to be coercing them to be Catholic in some way. So we had to be ecumenical. And like every other city of any size, um, we had people from all over. We had uh, Muslim physicians, for example, from the Middle East, uh, working as specialists in the system. We had lots of people at the meatpacking plant, where I think they spoke uh, 28 languages or something like that. Uh, so we had to have a sensitivity to the fact that not everyone was Catholic. That was one issue. How do you talk to people about the mission who aren't Catholic? The other is how do you talk, how do you get people who aren't used to talking about anything having to do with something like the mission to their employees? Uh, and that was, that was the real challenge. <laughs> and what I found was most important was getting the leaders to help make connections between the mission and the work that their employees were doing, to, to pick out examples and talk to their employees about it. I, I had an experience shortly after I arrived uh, in that position. I went out to a little rural hospital, um, which had an amazing setup there. They had you know, a very high-end um, uh, CAT scan and uh, MRI machine and um, first-rate lab equipment and all these other things. But what the CEO wanted to show me was a room where um, they did mammograms. Because prior to uh, my arrival there, it had been kind of uh, drab uh, lighting like this, fluorescent lighting in the ceiling. Um, and it wasn't a very comfortable place to be. And they heard from their patients that, that it wasn't a pleasant experience. Nobody likes to get a mammogram. And, the setting didn't help. So they said, we can do something about the setting. So they put warm colors of paint on the walls, they put in indirect lighting, and they invested in a bunch of fluffy pink velour robes so that every woman who came in got this very comfy thing to put on instead of gowns. You know. um, and they got great results. So the, the CEO was really um, proud to tell me about this. And so I said back to him, I figured, okay, I'm, I'm the mission guy, I, I've got to say this. I said, wow, that is a great example, a great instance of our, compa our, our, our values of compassion and hospitality, which are two of the values that the system relates to its mission. And he kind of drew back and screwed up his face and said, well, I guess I never thought about that. But of course, why did they do it? It's because they had compassion for their patients. They wanted them to feel welcome. They were living the values, but the leader wasn't saying to everybody, hey, this is what we mean when we talk about compassion and hospitality. So he wouldn't have had to do anything different about the actions he took. It's just about drawing people's attention and connecting the dots. 
So my shorthand for how do you communicate the mission in a Catholic organization is help people connect the dots. It doesn't mean having a big session about the mission. It doesn't mean uh, developing a program necessarily, but it means individual leaders, as I'm talking about healthcare, figuring out how to talk to their employees about what they do in the lab, or what they do in the office, or what they do at the bedside, and how it's a manifestation of the mission. Okay. Seton Hall is not a healthcare institution. We've just been hearing from Neil about some of the complexities in, involved in thinking about what a Catholic university is. Um, so I don't want to make comparisons that aren't warranted here. But I do think um, that it's still a matter of individual faculty members and administrators finding ways, first of all, that they connect to the mission, and that will be different for different people, and then finding a way of expressing that and helping their students find those similar connections, uh, and especially connections that have to do with what they're learning, if you're talking about faculty and students. How does, how does my field have anything to do with the mission? How is what we're learning reflective of what this university is all about? So th that's just kind of my, that's a general approach um, that I'll probably keep talking about <coughs> during my time here. Um, but I want to make a series of points. That was the first point. Let me kind of back up now uh, to a different level. and. Uh, Talk about the big picture of why Catholic institutions exist in the, in the really big picture. Um, and Neil will appreciate this too because he's a theologian like I am. So I'm painting with very broad brush strokes. But I want to talk just briefly about the Catholic meta-narrative, we'll call it. The big picture story that, that we believe about the way the world is. <coughs> Um, it's about God and creation. How's God related to what God has created? So I'm just going to make a. We're going to go through this really fast. Okay, this is this is uh, not even a sketch. One key thing about God, as Catholics and most Christians believe in God, is God is transcendent. In other words, God is not another thing, not even the biggest, baddest, most powerful thing in the universe. God's not like that. God's not in the universe in the way other things are in the universe. God is the creator of the universe. God's not limited by space-time the way what God has created is. And if there are multiverses, other universes that exist, God's the creator of those as well. So God is transcendent. Another point I want to make about this relationship is about the kinds of beings that God created us to be. <coughs> so we hear often that we're made in the divine image. And the Catholic tradition understands that as meaning, among other things, that we are we have intelligence, we can understand, and reason. We're free. God's freedom is unlimited, ours is more limited, but we are free to make choices. Uh, we have the capacity to love. Another thing about human beings is that we're social. We're made for community. So we're born, and right away we need to be with someone who can take care of us. And we become who we're supposed to be by learning from other people. So to say human beings are social, it's not rocket science. It's just, I mean, well, look, here we are. What are you doing this afternoon? <laughs> we're with other people. And we're invited to be friends of God. That's another thing about this relationship. We are invited into uh, divine friendship. 
that if we want to say what's the reason God created us, that's it. <clears throat> now, another fact about this relationship is that we have distorted, messed up the relationship with God through sin and willfulness and ignorance. So all is not as it should be between us and God. But God has provided a solution and the solution's already working away. And it, the, the principal way that solution happened is through the mission of the Son, the Word of God, through the Incarnation, Jesus becoming one of us, the second person of the Trinity, taking on a human nature, and also through the mission of the Spirit, who was sent uh, to dwell in the hearts of people. So the Lonergan, uh, obviously I'm a Lonergan professor, I'm going to refer to him from time to time, um, talks about Jesus being the outer word of God. We can see, people could see Jesus. They could listen to him. He touched people. He, he was an actor on the stage of human history. And the purpose of his mission was for us to carry on his meaning and to be outer words for each other so that people can hear us watch how we behave so we have worship of various kinds and art and Bibles and we write books all these outward manifestations that communicate the constitutive meaning and cognitive meanings of who we are among other things and the effective meanings by our actions and the Spirit is the inner word of God, changing hearts and minds immediately. Um, without, it's just, it's God coming to us and changing us. So God changes us so that we can cooperate in the work of repairing the world. He's, I like to think of the mission of the Son and the mission of the, of the Spirit as, among other things, recruiting missions. They, were, they came to gather us up and bring us along. You know, Jesus telling uh, the two apostles, you'll be fishers of men, fishers of human beings. So the Catholic University, among other things, it stands, understands itself at that highest level as participating, in, as cooperating with what God's trying to do in the world. That's a hard thing to bring into the classroom in a lot of cases, okay, but just, just hold that. And of course there's a further point, the last point I want to make about this relationship between God and, and creation and us, that the ultimate destiny that God intends for all, of, all human beings, what, what God intends is for us to enjoy a, an eternal communal participation in God's own life. So we often call that heaven. It doesn't really capture uh, a lot in some ways, um, but it's a fulfillment that goes far beyond what any of us could ever ask or imagine to kind of paraphrase St. Paul. And among other things, Catholic universities hopefully are a place where that whole narrative, the meta-narrative, the big picture of of what the world is really about can be talked about, can be presented. Not foisted on people, not at the center of every class. You know, I've taken calculus and I just don't know where you'd fit that in. But, but it's in, it's back there. It's the backdrop against which everything else happens. <coughs> and hopefully, uh, as much as possible, um, faculty administrators who, who aren't part of the Catholic community in, in that strict sense do have an opportunity to, to understand more about the big picture story of what, of what uh, we think the real world is about. So if you look on the, uh, the, the website of Seton Hall University, it talks about there being over 90 programs here. So this is the third thing I want to talk about, the fact that Catholic University is really interested in learning, helping people learn about everything. Now, when you have a university, I'm talking about the model where we have the liberal arts 
that's a big portion of what we do. And there are universities that don't function that way, as we just heard. But this university, which we all happen to be at, does have that opportunity. And from Catholicism's perspective, we want to know as much as we can about God and ourselves and the world. Because we're part of something important, something, um, something massively important. And we want to be tuned in to what it is. And what's our role in that? So having all those opportunities to study different disciplines, to get different angles on God through studying theology or religious studies or philosophy, <coughs> comparative religions, and about ourselves through the social sciences and through literature and uh, so forth. And learning about the material world, uh, which is fascinating, the physics, the geology, the chemistry, the biology of the natural world. So we want to be, we want to learn those things because we're trying to figure out what's going on here and what is our part in it. And we also want to be grateful from a Catholic standpoint, from a Christian share of this and other people of other faiths, we want to be grateful for the beauty of all that intelligibility and all that. Things make so much sense in so many ways when you study the natural sciences or when you study literature and the social sciences. You, you learn more about how, how humans operate. And there's a lot to be grateful for and to admire and to appreciate the beauty of. But we also want to study because the world in certain ways is a big mess. And we want to be able to, di to identify those and diagnose them. And we want to be able to propose, or at least work towards, solutions that have some chance of making a positive difference. And you need all the disciplines for that. And that's the beauty, one of the beauties, uh, of a university that is Catholic and includes all the disciplines that we've uh, got on the website, uh, including theology which is saying, uh, the, the commitment of the University of Theology is saying, if you want to talk about the real world, you've got to talk about God. Otherwise, you're talking about something else. You're leaving out something crucial. Um, so that's, that's uh, um, that willingness to address all those disciplines is important. Because we want our students to live as much as possible in the real world uh, and not in a fantasy land. Right? We want people to have as clear a view as possible of what's real. It's difficult to get there and we make lots of mistakes and we have a lot of partial knowledge, but to want that and to strive for it is really important. So I think there are ways that as people working at a university we can encourage students to want to seek knowledge for the sake of getting an ever truer understanding of the world. Um, Aristotle, and after him Thomas Aquinas, and later Lana, and many, many others, talk about humans having an innate desire to know. That's part of how we're made. But as we all know for ourselves, and if any of us have kids, um, I've got five, um, there are other competing desires that can shove um, something like the desire for knowledge over to the margins of your consciousness. Um, other things can seem more urgent. So one thing professors can do, for example, the faculty can do, is to talk to people, even briefly, briefly about that, the fact that, hey, I know there. I know you at some level. You all want to learn, but you have to. We have to get things out of the way that are going to be obstacles for that. It's as simple as the thing that many faculty do: no cell phones, no laptops. Depends on the kind of course, right? Um, but just to make it clear that um, that 
the desire to learn needs to be respected. And among other things, that means when you have a question, please ask it. Because that's you telling yourself you want to get to something true you want to understand. I think it's also important when dealing with students to tell them that understanding is difficult, the quest for knowledge is difficult. Lonergan has a great line in insight somewhere, um, or part of a sentence, knowledge makes a bloody entrance, which is a great slogan for the pirates <laughs> of Seton Hall. Um, but understanding is difficult. The world is complex. We can't leave students ever with the sense that slogans will do. And you can throw around concepts that are abstract. And because that makes it sound like you know something that you've really, you're in a position to either diagnose or really do something about an area of life that needs fixing. So that hard work of understanding the concrete. And the, the, the one other thing I want to mention in connection with trying to get out the truth is bias. Now bias is in the literature everywhere. If you read certain articles and books, it sounds like we're so biased we might as well give up. You know, every presupposition is a bias. Well, I don't believe that, and that's a longer topic. But it is important that we ask ourselves what's getting in the way of our asking questions or considering all the relevant data that we should be looking at or accepting answers that seem to have pretty good evidence behind it, but they don't square with what we'd like them to be, what we'd like the answers to be. So we won't accept them. And there can be biases like that in students. There can be biases like that in faculty and administrators. There can be biases like that in the methods of disciplines sometimes. And so one trait that professors, uh, faculty and administrators could um, talk about with students, just, just briefly, right? Just when there's an opportunity, <coughs> just say it right here, like the leaders in healthcare, take the opportunity when it presents itself uh, about the importance of being self-critical. Um, not everything we believe is true is true, and everyone who gets to read Plato's allegory of the cave uh, in the core curriculum finds out about that. Okay, and I want to finish uh, with just a couple more things. And that has to do with values <clears throat> and the good. Besides wanting all the truth, Catholic universities are interested in every true value that's out there. So people like Lonergan and John Finnis, Lonergan has a scale of values, and John Finnis has seven fundamental values that uh, they're both Catholic, and they talk about those being present uh, in, in, in human living. And one of the sort of the rules about these lists of values is you want to make sure that you don't enact you don't realize any value in a way that does a disservice to the other types of value. You're trying to hold them all in abeyance, or not in abeyance, all in the balance. So for example, just to take a, uh, from Catholic's social teaching, I'm not using either one of their lists. Catholicism makes a big deal about human dignity. We're made in the image of God. So where do we get our value, our worth as people? Not because we've accomplished anything, not because it's granted to us by any group of people or by any government or whatever. We're valuable because we're creatures of God and we're made in God's image, period. So every individual um, has that, that innate value. And so, doesn't matter how disagreeable we find the person, uh, what they're like to look at, how they behave. This is a big issue in behavioral health in the healthcare system. It's often hard to deal with people with behavioral health issues. But they have dignity, even when they're, when they're at their worst, swearing at you and uh, tearing things and throwing things. So that's one value. The other value that we talked about a lot is the common good. Now that's thinking about the value of the community. And what does the community mean? 
Human dignity leads to you to think about what does this person need. The common good tends to make you think about what does the group need. But of course, you need to respect both of those. You can't care for the community in a way that undermines individual worth, and you can't care for individuals in a way that doesn't take account of the community. So there's, there's always a, a both and uh, aspect to this, as there is in so many things in Catholicism. How do you, you always feel the tension between taking care of the individual and taking care of the group. And it's good to feel the tension, just like parents do when they're trying to figure out how to, what's best for the family and what's best for this child. It's good to feel the tension because that means you're feeling the value on either side of you and you're trying to strike the proper arrangement. So, faculty and administrators can talk about the fact that you can't leave any important value off the table when you're thinking about the right thing to do. You can't get them out of order because you're under time pressure, because you're anxious for some reason, because you have a too narrow goal. And again, that's something that can be exemplified in the, the study that happens in certain kinds of classes. The last remark I'm going to make is that students, like the rest of us, are engaged in a lifelong process of making selves. Their choices and the experiences they have and the things they learn are causing them to develop into a certain kind of person. And we're here to assist them with that. And so I think it's important, one way of respecting the mission of a Catholic university is for us as faculty and as administrators always to keep in mind the, the absolutely critical project that the students are engaged in. Uh, to respect them for that and to be on the lookout for ways we can connect the dots between what the thing that just happened in class or the thing that just happened last night that everybody heard about and the kinds of people we're becoming. Because the kinds of people we are are made in the image of God. And we want to cooperate with that emergence of an ever truer image of God um, to whatever extent we can. So I'll conclude my remarks there. Thank you. This was great. So we have uh, a little time for some questions. I just thought that uh, as I listened to uh, Neil and Mike, I thought of a line from Cardinal Newman's uh, The Idea of the University, where he's talking about the importance of books. And he basically is saying, hey, university is where people meet people, and you meet other people. And, and in that process, you're changed. And uh, as I listened to Mike and Neil, I thought of this uh, quote for, that Newman has. He says, the general principles of any study you may learn by books at home, but the detail, the color, the tone, the air, the life which makes it live in us, you must catch all these from those in whom it lives already. So I think we've been fortunate this afternoon to have a couple of people in whom um, the life of the mind lives and uh, and we're privileged to have them with us. So any any particular questions that uh, anybody would have, we'll have a few minutes at least for this. I, I would like to please ask, I'm Paula Franzisi from the law faculty. Hi everyone. Thank you for your beautiful talks. Thank you. They were inspired and very inspiring. I ask, mindful that we're a community of educators about the principal demographic of which most of our students are a part. And they are susceptible in many ways to the less than virtuous wars of the world in which they participate. I'm thinking about social media, 
I'm thinking about the anonymity of virtual spheres, the facelessness of various platforms, and the less than principled values driven ways in which they see many operating. So how is it that we, in preparing our students for worlds that are sometimes quite terribly at odds with our mission and our first principles, how do we prepare our students responsibly and how do we issue the exhortation against cynicism? <laughs> I'll let you take that, Neil. <laughs> uh, it reminded me of, um, uh, I think it was a, a Catholic University business school, which adopted as its slogan, uh, Darwin was right. And the dis... The Darwin dis was right. Darwin was right. Survival of the fittest. And the incongruity between this sort of social Darwinism and what should be the Catholic identity of that institution was just a bit too, too much, really. Um, and uh, I mean, there, there, there are so many forces operating, particularly in highly competitive and um, <coughs> uh, aggressively competitive societies. I think that you know, a lot of US society is like that. For people to take shortcuts, to people to find quick and easy ways of um, doing things which are simply not ethical, um, to prioritise um, personal wealth accumulation over the common good. Um, so, I mean, there's a huge problem here, which is not just uh, uh, what, what happens within the educational situation is how much can you take that on? Um, <clears throat> and if, if a business school can't see the incongruity of you know, adopting a social Darwinism in a Catholic institution, then there is a cultural issue within the institution itself that needs to address that. Um, they're the sort of cultural change issues which, again, having been visited various Catholic universities at different times, I've seen their people sort of struggling with how to do this. Um, I, obviously there are no quick and easy answers to this. Um, so, uh, are there are there courses in ethics? Are there legal practice courses which focus on? I'm sure there are, but then they probably cheat in the exams. I can, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, and this this comes down not just then to the university, but to the family situation, their earlier schooling, and the society into which they're moving which has exactly these set of expectations, that they will be highly competitive, aggressively so, and not concern themselves with the common good, but with personal enrichment. Um, and we, our university did set up a law faculty, and because our vice chancellor was a lawyer, so he thought we better have a law faculty. And they did try and integrate that sort of vision into their law program, um, which was good. I, I just don't know how successful that was. I just don't know. I have no data on it. Um, but uh, at least the attempt was there to try and form conscience uh, around principles of Catholic social teaching. Uh, requiring students to do a certain amount of pro bono work as part of their program and so on. Uh, but yes, look, it's a really hard one. <laughs> yeah. oh, I, I was just going to, to add that uh, part, part of the difficulty is that um, I was thinking about social media, for, uh, for example. Uh, all these habits of thinking and these habits of feeling that get developed 
over time uh, mm. may need changing, but you can't, it's very hard to get rid of a habit by just saying stop. Mm. Generally, you have to displace an unhelpful habit with a more helpful one, and that's the real, I don't have an answer to that, but that's, that's the problem uh, as I see it. Yeah, that's part of the aspect of the problem. And, uh, and, and that, particularly that whole social media thing, I mean, uh, we, our children are now in their sort of 30s. <coughs> our eldest is 40. Just, <coughs> yes, that's very uncomfortable, but anyway. Um, uh, we didn't have to worry about social media with them. It just wasn't an issue. Now, one of the big questions facing my kids in raising their kids is, well, when do children get their first phone? When do they get their first smartphone? And all the complexities that that opens up. And we, this is such a modern problem that we just haven't developed the ethical tools of reflection on how to handle this. We're, we're playing catch up. Uh, at, a, at a time of rapid social change in the way in which people interact through social media. And uh, it's not a good place to be in ethically in trying to play catch up in that way. Yeah, I was just sort of going to follow up, Paula. I feel you painting a picture of the I mean, I think there are some early interventions, and Marisa and I talked a little bit about that later on, some of the things that we've tried to do with our first year students. But I think where it starts to fall is when you have the confidence of the realization of the debt in reality, as opposed to, oh, I owe $150,000 in student debt when I'm finished. When that reality actually starts to sink in, what that means. And that's where I think things really start to fall apart for students when their sudden fixation becomes grades, exams, got to get a job, got to, all that starts to kick in. So my feeling, and I'm sure other people might agree or disagree, is when they first come in, before that's really kicked in, is the time to try to instill some of these ideas of, yeah, you know, that's important and horrible, and I don't know how they will. But there are other things, because if you leave it until that has assimilated, then everything becomes about competitiveness and jobs and yeah. all the rest of it. I know it's not an answer, but it's a thought. Uh, yeah, Roseanne. So when, we, when you talk about um, the liberal arts thriving at Catholic universities, I'm not really sure they're thriving here. Um, and so I, I think that we really need to think about that. A, a couple of colleagues and I want to write this paper, Academia's Dirty Little Secret. And the dirty little secret is you can still go to top universities and major in the liberal arts. But if you come to a place like Seton Hall, you better be in the sciences or STEM or whatever. And we're selling the students sort of a false bill of goods. If you saw the New York Times yesterday, they said poets in the long run do better. I don't know if everybody saw that article, but I think it starts before they come here. It's, it's the admissions office and the admissions people who are selling professional education to our students. And our liberal arts programs, I mean, we have a core, but it really only substituted to philosophy and religion courses. We didn't really expand everything. And our liberal arts are shrinking, and our students are here in particular shying away from them. So what can we do? at Seton Hall to sort of counterbalance the administration and the admissions offices need to bring us tons of biology majors mm -hmm. at the expense of the liberal arts. And quite frankly, not really serving those students who are biology majors, mm -hmm. I, I think. Right. Yeah. I don't know the answer to that question. But that that is a real, I mean, it is a real problem. We, you know, the, the expense of education, the need to try to find a good paying career once you're out of here um, can lead to exactly that kind of thing which of course is counterproductive to the idea of this more holistic uh, education that Catholic universities should be striving for somehow yeah so it, it, there, there are pressures and it, it takes it's sort of like in Catholic healthcare it's just, there's a 
a, a similar kind of problem on the financial side. It's true of, of healthcare generally now, as reimbursement levels decline, their margin gets squeezed and squeezed. And especially for Catholic healthcare, that's particularly committed to taking care of the poor and the marginalized, um, it becomes a real issue. And, and what it forces you to do is to get very clear about what is most important and to be very creative, in a, in a sense to be smarter than other systems because you've got to figure out how to, how to keep going and how to compete even though um, on the charity care side there are greater demands being made of you. So um, that's not an answer really, it's just saying uh, the solution to the problem is usually concrete and which means it's slightly different in each case and so the case here I've only been here a month and I don't really know what's going on with respect to that whole situation but I believe you that it's it's an issue uh, and, and it's uh, not just an issue about liberal arts tradition in that sort of undergraduate program it's a globally it's a problem about arts faculties internationally uh, a number of Australian universities, their arts faculties are shrinking. Um, they, they're not getting uh, the interest of students in doing pursuing arts degrees. Um, so, you know, you've seen arts faculties shrink by half or more. Uh, particular schools within those faculties major shrinking. Um, and <coughs> That's part of, um, as I said, the, there's a there's a shift. The, ins the institution which we call a university is now trying to solve a different set of problems. It's no longer trying to solve the cultural reproduction problem. It's trying to solve the economic employment engagement function, and that's a valid. I mean, that's a valid issue. Um, but uh, as I said, there there are also issues of cost and all that sort of stuff, um, you know. Um, so uh, while we may feel the loss of that, uh, as I said, we we may need to find <coughs> alternate ways in which to provide what was always uh, the interest of a relatively small group of people. We have a lot of independent theological colleges in Australia. And I think for a lot of them, that sort of loss of liberal arts, religion focus in the public university sector becomes an opportunity for second career degrees. So a lot of the students in theological colleges are in their 40s and 50s. They're studying part-time. Uh, they're studying alongside seminarians, but they're asking midlife issues about meaning and purpose, and they're there because they want to be. Uh, and those sort of questions, they have then an opportunity and a place in which they can begin to address the sort of questions that a liberal arts would have prepared you for. Thank you. Great point. <coughs> Um, I want to ask you about what I perceive to be two tensions in your presentations and how we should think about them. The first is the idea that Catholic identity is distinct from but dependent or interrelated with a more broad liberal arts training, sort of disciplining of the mind and questioning. Um, that's neither, so Catholic identity or a university characterized by Catholic values includes some <coughs> ongoing understanding of the human person as whatever the cultural moment yeah. in need of a kind of disciplining of the heart and mind to perceive the world correctly and to sort of respond to whatever the cultural needs of the moment are. So there's a tension between sort of Catholic identity and, and a broader commitment to liberal arts, right, that is neither the memorizing of doctrine or the mere sort of being in church, although it may include both those things as well. So how do we, how ought we to think about those two poles? And then secondly, um, there's a kind of a, a distinct sort of, a kind of university needs to be attentive to the development of the cultures it lives in. But there's also a sort of continuity of purpose 
an identity, even if that's understood developmentally. So how do we think about the kind of persistent role or piece of the role of a Catholic university in any culture and time, and at the same time its sensitivity to that development? And similarly, how do we think about the, the sort of distinctly Catholic piece of a, a Catholic identity in terms of its, its educational purposes, yeah. and at the same time the sort of broader commitment to the liberal arts that it can share with any number of non-Catholic and perhaps even non-religious sort of scholars, faculty, and teachers. Yeah. Are those real tensions? Or are they just perceived tensions? Well, is it, does any of it have to do with the distinction between grace and nature? Absolutely. <laughs> okay, well then I'm glad you asked the question. No. I know this uh, great guy wrote a book on that. Well, no, but... Um, <laughs> um, I, I, I do think the Catholic vision of reality does try to integrate both the you know, formation of the person uh, in a sense for their own sake, but then it's also you're being formed for the sake of service. Uh, and and um, there are certain features of Catholicism that have been preached and taught and done century to century to century, certain kinds of changes and so on, but there is that, there is that real, real continuity. Um, I don't really see that being in conflict with the, with the fact that the, the culture in which you're living uh, undergoes change, society undergoes change, new needs arise. I mean, w the last time, when I was at Gonzaga University teaching, and this was only 10 years ago, there, was, there were very few students walking around like this. Now everybody walks around like this, looking at their phones. And so <coughs> so that this, this change that we've talked about that's been very rapid and very dramatic and some of the effects it has on people. Um, uh, does, requires creativity and dealing with it, some understanding, some research, some what are what are alternatives that could supply the need without doing it in such a, mm -hmm. an unhelpful way. Um, but you're still doing it in the context of faith, hope, and charity, and God's providence, and the fact that um, all those all those values are still the same and, and in a sense ground our commitments because of who we are and because of our eternal destiny it's worth trying to figure this out as opposed to just saying oh well you know the world's going to hell and I'm just gonna go watch TV <laughs> I mean honestly the, the the kind of despair and cynicism that can set in when you think things were Lonergan talks about the social surge when a, an unintelligible solution gets piled on top of another unintelligible solution, you know, wrong-headed solutions to problems that don't really work, and pretty soon you have a situation you look at it and say, I don't know how to fix that. I don't know where to get purchase on that. I can't get traction. So I think, and that's, that's where hope and faith and love give you the, the staying power and the courage, um, and sometimes even the insight um, to, to find something that will improve the situation. And I'm, I'm, those are very, very general terms in which I'm speaking, but I, um, uh, the outer word and the inner word, they're still at work uh, through us and in us. And, um, I, we can't fall prey to the temptation that we've met a problem that's going to overcome us, that's going to take away our value. We have to. Yeah, I think that's that was more of a little homily. I think that will answer. But uh, it, it's interesting in Australia we have <coughs> one liberal arts college uh, set up by a group of Catholic um, finance well, people, Catholics with deep pockets actually. It's been operating now at least 10 years, probably 12 years. Last I looked, their effective student load was 70 students. 
this is a, a college in the middle of one of the highest population growth areas in Sydney. And it's simply not attracted anyone. Uh, on the other end of the scale, our larger, one of our largest universities and most prestigious universities, Melbourne University, uh, introduced the model of generalised undergraduate degrees followed by professional degrees. So you do your professional publication as a graduate program. Um, <coughs> the cynic in me thinks that their main reason for doing this is that they could get more money because uh, they could charge more. Undergraduate fees are capped in Australia by the government. Okay, so all the universities basically charge the same amount at the undergraduate level, but not at the graduate level. So the more they could push people into graduate programs, the more money they could make. Almost immediately in their undergraduate program, their arts faculty was slashed. Okay, so, as I say, it, uh, in the, the two Catholic universities, one is public, one is private, their basic functions have grown out of teacher education and nursing education, both of which have strong Catholic traditions, Catholic hospitals and Catholic schools. So their, their largest faculties are oriented towards the providing of staff into Catholic institutions, uh, yeah, schools and, uh, and hospitals. It has branched out into other areas such as social work um, and uh, health, allied health professionals and so on. But the focus of most of that undergraduate professional education is in what you would call helping professions. Uh, maybe what fits into that, I'm not sure. But uh, yeah, so in that sense, they are responding to a very Catholic need. I think, but not seeing it in terms of providing liberal arts, but in terms of providing people who would work professionally in areas in the Catholic context. Marissa, you had your hand up, and maybe, yeah, maybe just a couple more questions. This has been very rich. Um, I was responding to liberal arts versus STEM. Um, I can't speak for admissions at all, but I know from, I work in freshman studies, so I know that the students, from our discussions with them and advising, it's their family that is saying you're either in a STEM or computer science, or you're not, or you don't go or you'll go to community college. We'll pay, we'll help you go to this expensive Catholic school if you are in STEM. Um, and if you then proceed to do professional work in physical therapy or a physician's assistant or the joint degree now with that gets you an interview only in the medical school if you have a 3.9 GPA at the end of you know, three years of this really rigorous work. So it's very difficult when they, they're they not doing that well and they want to do something else, but their family does not support them in that way. It's, it's a cultural thing for the most part and it's just the way people, right, some of our, many of our students are entering this university. That's the conversations we have with them. We try to get them to do theater. Um, because they love the theater. I love the theater. But um, their family just won't allow it to happen. So I just want to add, you know, my daughter years ago wanted to be a theater major. And she applied and she got into school to be a theater major. And she came home towards the end of the senior year in high school and said, Mom, maybe I shouldn't be a theater major. And I said, why not? And she said, because all my parents, my friends' parents, are not letting them be theater majors. 
and I said to her, what do you love? And she said, I love the theater. I said, then you will be a theater major. <laughs> but there, there's very cool, I guess, foolish parents, such as myself, who tell your children to study what you love. And parents don't tell their, because they're afraid, because they're spending, afraid. you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars on an education. So I understand that. But we haven't, we haven't communicated to parents that it's actually better to be a theater maker than it is to do a STEM because you're going to get specific skills as a STEM major that are, you're, you're not going to have in 20 years. And that's why, the, that's why I changed it. Don't get it started on it, but I think it's very true what she says. Uh, last question. How is that? So, so I, I liked your analysis of uh, kind of the evolution of the university. Um, you know, when you look at a Catholic university, in the U.S., it's, it's, it's an amalgamation of many of the things you talked about, um, especially a Catholic university. But, but um, if you look at the university, I mean, a lot of it started as a monastic communities to, trying to literally, you know, uh, write down and figure out and decipher the mind of God. And then, of course, they went out to you know, their communities for salvation, as we were talking about, and, and you know, helping form people, the formation aspect of the university that you have there. Then you have sort of the, the, the guilds, or the, the formation of the, the bakers, and the shoemakers, and the iron workers, and all that kind of stuff that you need to maintain your communities and your societies. And then, which, you know, the British, of course, took to, to mean to build up your empire. You need accountants, and lawyers, and all these <coughs> practical people to maintain the empire. And, and then, of course, you have the, the German uh, university, or the idea of the research university, which which uh, per the Germans was mostly you know, science and engineering and, and building up the practicality of that. The American university is sort of an amalgamation. There's 3,000 universities and you have, yeah, your, your very strict liberal arts that you know, is for the formation of the person, whatever with the discussion we've been having. Then you have your strict research university, which is about developing new knowledge and new technologies and new things. And then you sort of have the teaching of professions, the jobs. So, so I think the Catholic University in America these days, having been um, an institution that came out of uh, a necessity uh, of being a marginalized, uh, persecuted community in the U.S., a minority community in the U.S., Catholics were, you know, they weren't going to go, they weren't going to go to the Princetons and the Harvards, the, the, the elite, you know, Protestant uh, institutions. So, you know, once, uh, when uh, when uh, Bishop Bailey built this, and, and uh, uh, you know. Uh, Mary, uh, Elizabeth Van Seaton built the, the Catholic educational system. It was about helping this marginalized community. Now in the 21st century, I, I, we we're not as Catholics of uh, an overly marginalized community. Um, so, so, I, so I wonder about, you know, what is, people ask me, what is the point of a Catholic university in the, in the year two, uh, you know, 2019, 2020? You know, I say, well, I, I think there's, especially what I think City Hall tries to do, or, or at least in my very idealized version of it, is it tries to, to have you have a professional education, and then of course the development of new knowledge, the research university, we try to do both, both of those, but also I think there's that, you were talking about balance, but I think there's, there's the third thing that counterbalances both of those, which is the formation of a, of a, of a, a useful person, yes, but, but also a person that, uh, that, that, that is, like you said, has a conversation about God and doesn't and is not limited in their in their thinking, they're discussing what, what, what they're trying to do. So I think it's it's sort of an amalgamation of all, of those three things. Is it most successfully or not? I mean that's that's a whole other conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah it's um, uh, how can I the, yeah, the 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 amalgamation of Research and teaching, I think, is one of the big. Oh, that's right. I remember one. The but I wanted to make some one thing we haven't spoken of uh, in all this is the way in which the staff of a university should be able to contribute to the intellectual life of the culture that they're in, um, <coughs> out of their research and out of their expertise. Um, we're focused a lot on the students, but. Um, part of being a university, and this is one of the things I think where a Catholic university uh, should be contributing, is to give voice to uh, those values which uh, are, are common, but which are emphasised in, say, Catholic social teaching and Catholic respect for life, all these sort of things. 
that we, a Catholic university should provide uh, for some of the intellectual power to be able to contribute to public debates. Um, it's not a research function, it's not a teaching function, it's a community engagement function. But I would argue it's a combination of both. It, it comes I mean, through that. If, if, if you're going to produce a, a scientist, you, you would want them to have, uh, I mean, at least as a Catholic university, a Catholic viewpoint and a morality and understanding there. Same thing if you're developing them to be a lawyer or an accountant yeah. or, or a business person. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we have. I mean, that's where the action yeah. comes into, yeah. in, into hand. There, there is, yeah, the, the, the formal people with a lot of uh, theory, but, but then the, the action part is where. Yeah, we, we have various forms of government review and regulation. So they, they review all our retention rates. And Know, you know, all that sort of stuff. They review our research quality on a two or three year basis. We have to go through this massive progress. Now they're reviewing our community engagement and uh, asking universities to demonstrate how they're engaged in the community in various ways. I mean, it's oppressive. It really is very oppressive. But you're, you're chartered to be a benefit to society, right? Yeah, absolutely. Jose, well, you don't like your own question. <laughs> anyway, it has been wonderful, and I've been delighted to have these two wonderful people here and to share with us, and uh, I'm sure we'll stay around and, and continue the conversation. So thank you very much.